Good afternoon. It is indeed an honor to be here. I would like to thank Karina Gore and this powerful organizing team of this conference, to President Jones and to Union, to all of the organizers and sponsors, Green Faith. And I want to thank so many of the wonderful writers who have been assisting many of us in getting our comments together and our remarks together. Particular thanks to Dr. Kate Ott, Dr. Cynthia Molabita, Dr. Larry Rasmussen, and the Earth Honoring Faith community. The connection between social justice and earth justice is imperative if we develop re proper responses to climate change. Many African Americans involved in environmental justice movements insist that engaging race, class, gender, is central when examining the impact of climate change on communities of color and all around the planet. This kind of multi-layered analysis is also key in imagining new responses and solutions to raising the consciousness of peoples of color who have historically been oppressed by the same logic of domination at work when we see how vastly the planet is suffering. Dolores S. Williams, a professor and theologian who taught in these sacred halls at Union, helps to make this point very plainly in an essay entitled Sin, Nature, and Black Women's Bodies. Published in the volume entitled Ecofeminism and the Sacred, she draws parallels between the logic of domination at play in the institution of American slavery a period of more than 300 years, during which Africans were ripped from their continental homes, transported across and throughout the transatlantic slave trade, and sold to the highest bidder on American shores. The logic of domination present in American slavery is the same logic of domination at play in humans' treatment of the earth. Naming the ways that Christian theology has been complicit in oppressing the earth by framing theological assumptions and biblical interpretations that suggest a dominion over the earth, Williams actually questions these hierarchies within Christianity. Instead of having power over the earth, she, her essay prompts us to wonder why the Genesis passage isn't more likely interpreted to mean that humans ought to practice good stewardship with the earth. Williams then makes a very interesting turn, noting the agony and the pain and the lives of many African enslaved women who were forcibly raped and repeatedly impregnated to breed slaves, giving birth to sometimes more than 24 children. Williams draws a conclusion that is still piercing for us to consider. There is a connection between an economic system built on the backs of African slaves, free labor, white supremacy, and environmental injustice. As a theologian, Williams suggests that structural evil is at work at the very base of economic disparity and ecological destruction. The very act of defiling both the bodies of African enslaved women's bodies and the body of the earth is sin. Drawing upon Paul Tillich's definition of sin, Williams makes us see a very cruel reality of climate change. There are connections between the historical impact of this sin of defilement done to the reproductive systems of enslaved African and African American women, including racial disparities in education, economic disparities, barriers to employment opportunities, lack of access to fresh food in food deserts, and the legacy of white supremacy in North America, and the process of strip mining. The same logic of domination and control at work during slavery is the same logic at work when we see humans have the right to rip out the womb of mountains. While there are many dangers to strip mining, in order to feed humans death-dealing dependency on fossil 
fossil fuels, we become complicit in the sin of defilement by damaging the very capacity of that mountain to reproduce. It is the prophetic voice of eco-womanism that speaks truth to power by calling us out from within. The prophetic is a central feature of my own theorizing of eco-womanism. It calls for the hard ethical work that needs to be done to respond to immediate ecological issues like climate change and also recognizes the systematic violence both rooted in our theologies and our histories that needs to be carefully remembered in order to act more justly. By examining these eco-memories as counter-memories, necessary for the movement these are necessary for the movement to move forward. Eco-womanism is an approach to environmental ethics that I describe as centering the perspectives of women of color, especially women of African descent, by giving rise to their voices, experiences, and responses to climate change and eco-justice. It uncovers the ecological beauty and burden paradox alive in so much of African-American environmental history. This burden and beauty paradox pinpoints the dynamic influence of the natural and social order on African-American experience and outlook on earth justice. Consider the dynamic relationship that African-Americans have with the earth. From images of farming, to sharecropping, to lynching, the tree, the harvest, and the garden all have particular and often paradoxical meanings to African Americans. Southern trees bear a strange fruit Blood on the leaves and blood at the root. Black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. Strange fruit hanging from the poplar tree. Perhaps the most visual image of ecological burden and beauty paradox is the paradoxical image of trees as resting place and lynchings. Black bodies swinging from the limbs of southern trees at the hands of white hatred and mobs hungry for blood and control. This image, too, is a part of environmental history. As James H. Cohn's book, The Cross and the Lynching Tree, illustrates so brilliantly, lynchings as a part of American history has an important theological significance and I would argue a deep ecological significance as well. If we take these images, these voices, and these perspectives from African American environmental history into account, then pricking the consciousness of religious people who might be swayed to change their anthropocentric attitudes becomes more hopeful. Examining our behavior and examining the logic of domination might help people to change their minds, head and heart. Black liberation theology has made this point before. The work of framing climate justice must be linked to the agenda of social justice. In the scholarship of Dolores Williams, James Cone, James Forbes, Emily Towns, all professors here at Union, Diane Glave, and many others make a link between the full liberation of peoples of color, black peoples, and the liberation of the earth. Alice Walker, a literary artist and poet, writes that until the earth is free, no one is free. 
This concept indelibly links the future of the planet with the future of peoples of the planet. Eco-womanist method adds to this discourse with compelling arguments for the radical inclusion of voices of peoples of color into the environmental justice movement. And the work to raise awareness about climate change that is for us to do this weekend. Like most forms of liberation theology, the seven-step eco-womanist method begins with honoring experience naming one's own eco-autobiography in order to find out why we really came to this work in the first place. It moves to reflection on experience, posing questions of history to tell us the truth about systemic oppressions and structural evil that has been used to repress the voices of people of color and violate the earth. Step three invites the application of womanist analysis to examine environmental degradation. It uses intersectional analysis and looks at cases of environmental racism and climate injustice throughout the planet. The deep questioning of history and tradition prompted by the previous analysis takes place in step four. This step reveals more accurate accounts of African-American environmental history and uncovers religious heritages and contributions that are helpful for building a proper ethic. Here, eco-womanism helps to examine intersectionality and the nature of the interlocking oppressions at work that undermine the wholeness in the self as well as planetary wholeness. Building upon womanist social analysis that insists that structural evil be exposed, eco-womanism turns to engaging transformation. It turns to looking at eco-womanist spirituality as a response to the crisis we are living in today. It focuses on theory and praxis, spiritual activism that is alive in many earth-honoring faith communities. It includes the ethical imperative for earth justice, alive in African and Native American cosmologies. Here, interrelationality, interconnectedness, and as Thich Nhat Hanh will call interbeing, become central keys towards living out a good religion for the earth. The sixth step is to really take a look at sharing dialogue with multiple religious perspectives, honoring the work that we are doing here today, and allowing that dialogue to shape us into doing new justice, acting and taking action for the earth. Eco-womanism helps to link social justice to earth justice, and it must be included in the conversation. There is a myth that African Americans have not been a part of the environmental justice movement. There is a myth that peoples of color around the planet don't know how to get into the conversation. But when we hear today and yesterday that the conversation is literally wiping out graveyards, taking churches and sweeping them into the tide, then we have to do the work of linking social justice to earth justice, that we all might be free. Thank you. <laughs>